So uh, this presentation is kind of a, a simple, uh, we, we've got a little TDMA and uh, ARQ Mac layer, all done in GNU Radio in GRC using usurps. Uh, I, I, I'm doing the presentation, and, and I did some of the framework, but this work is largely by uh, John, John Malsbury. He's another Edis research employee, and uh, he couldn't be with us today, so I'll be uh, kind of presenting on his behalf. So uh, uh, essentially, uh, I guess after seeing Tunnel Up High, I don't really have to say too much, but we have this motivation, and we just want a really nice two-way comms app to kind of go along with uh, – new radio and, and in addition i uh just to demonstrate proper usage to some of the you know features you're seeing uh that we've in, introduced like stream tags and how to properly do you know time and finite uh bursts with tx for example yeah and uh the nice thing about this app is it will be like phil said entirely in uh, grc and python for that matter so it should be easy to uh modify and understand and i hope this, this spurs some use um we don't have to say bad things about Tunnel Up High. So I'm kind of going to go through this presentation step by step and just build up to what is the final GRC flow graph, and there might be a lot of blocks in there. So I think if we go step by step, this will kind of make sense. Um, so uh, the first thing is I've got this little uh, GitHub project I call uh, GR Extras, and um, we, we kind of built on top of that. And uh, some of you who, who did presentations on here might want to just just uh, pay attention because I think I think some of the things on here in in this project might have actually helped you along the way, and uh, uh, th there's two big things there that might help. Uh, in GR Extras, we've done a little message passing API, um, and that's the ability just to send these. Um, you know, you, you have a you have a source block and a sync block or a source port and a sync port, and you can send uh, not streams but uh, some kind of message. Uh, from one guy to the other, and this is actually a very primitive but powerful thing that'll let you do more complicated things like, we'll say, a Mac layer or passing around packetized data. Um, and so, so the, this whole this whole thing is actually implemented entirely in on top of a stock new radio. There's no scheduler mods. It's just a uh, hierarchical block using the stream tags. Essentially, we're sending uh, streams with tags between blocks, throwing away the streams, and providing a little API to. Uh, push and pop the messages between source and sync blocks. Uh, and the other, the other real nice thing here is there's a, uh, you, you can write blocks entirely in Python. And, and we have this paradigm where you write the block in C++ and connect it up in Python. But what you can actually do is, is you can inherit in Python from gr.block, overload a work function, and the schedule will actually be calling your work, work function in Python with input and output buffers, and, and you can do all the work, deal with any stream tags completely in there. It, it's really for prototyping, but uh, for the application I'm going to show you, it's also okay. You know, it, It's not the fastest thing in the world, obviously, to use Python, but if you're dealing with overhead per, let's say, packet, it's really a lot lower than doing some per sample thing. So um, for, for anyone who's really finding that they need to bridge the gap between the C++ streams and Python, uh, I really think this is the way to go. You're just going to gonna get your function call with a, you know, a NumPy array, and you can deal directly with that. There's no point in stuffing things into meshed, meshed queues. It's, it's really integrated into the system. So you know, please take a look if that will help you. Uh, and then the other thing uh, is that extras is we have, just have a bunch of miscellaneous blocks. Some of them make use of these uh, message passing features, and, and I'll, I'll kind of show a few screenshots of that, and you'll, you'll see it in action with John's example. And I wanted to point out, since uh, Jonathan said yesterday we couldn't do templates, there's an excellent example in uh, GR Extras of using template and template specialization to do a generic adder block and use Volk. So uh, there's a link to the wiki page. You can go in, you can get, get clone that. There's a nice little coding guide on it as well, show you how to use it. And you can just um, pretty much make and make install on top of uh, existing GNU Radio installation. Uh, so I think this screenshot will help make things a little more sen make sense uh, as far as message passing. Um, you'll, you'll see at the top I've got a socket to blob and then a uh, packet frame. And what, you, what you're looking at in between that, that little white connection there is actually uh, there's messages being passed and not samples. And um, I'm saying the word blob, and maybe that doesn't make sense. Um, it, it, essentially, we have this little, all the tags are emblazoned on top of this polymorphic library we have in GNU Radio. And, and the blob is nothing more than a standard vector of characters. So what, what you end up with is a uh, memory pointer and a length. So you can actually preserve kind of a chunk of memory and, and pass it along like that. Um, 
uh, I guess what's kind of new is you see the, the packet framer V2 and the packet D framer are actually blocks that we have in, uh, I think, they're copies of blocks we have in uh, GR Digital or something that does some framing and deframing, but they're actually interfaced with the uh, message I.O. rather than having like a stream on one side and a Python callback on the other. So th th this little thing is going to let us do uh, this whole example coming up next. So um, this is, so I'm, I, I want to start kind of one, one block at a time before I show the big flow graph. This is... Um, I, I can only go into so much detail because I didn't, I didn't write the block. This is the TDMA engine, and you see several outputs and several inputs. And uh, there's uh, John's description that, right there. Uh, essentially, uh, it's got the, the, the one input is the usurp is actually uh, will take a usurp stream, and that gives this block a concept of uh, signal level and time. And then you see several kind of control packet stuff going in and out. Now, the... Uh, the control port in and out is currently not used. It's just left there as a uh, kind of a user hook to pass arbitrary stuff in. And I suppose you could go grab this, grab the underlying class and uh, get some control port messages in and out if you just wanted to. You know, it's just an easy hook to get uh, miscellaneous data in and out. Anyway, you, you can see the kind of the control messages. Um, we've got packets in and out. That would be uh, post Mac layer stuff. And this block would be entirely responsible for scheduling uh, packets and uh, dealing with received packets to implement TDMA. So um, here it is in action. Um, this is actually a hierarchical flow graph. Uh, what we have here is we plug the TDMA engine in, and there's the usurp source and usurp sync. And you can actually see the complete mod and demod chain. In this case, we've chose GMSK. And there's, there's the packet framer again. So we actually have the usurp source going right in the TDMA engine. And this is going to give that the concept of time and, uh, like, say, signal level. And then we also have the usurp source splitting out to the DMOD and the packet deframer. So this is actually going to produce, um, I guess, blobs of, of, uh, of data. And that's going to go into the engine. And also we have two framer on the other direction. We've got a packet framer modulator. And uh, here's something here. I'll, I'll talk about a few of the blocks in there. That we've got this precog burst gate. And actually, what that is responsible for is interpreting the start and stop tags for a burst and properly setting up the start and stop burst tags for a stream. And uh, one of the, one of the things we do here is the packet framer will put on kind of a. Uh, end of burst tag, but when it goes through the uh, modulator, you end up with some kind of interpolation, and the tag is not actually at the correct uh, position, sample position. So that block is actually responsible for moving the tag to deal with the interpolation. And the nice thing about this is you know, the packet frame or modulator really don't have to know anything about the, the well, the, the packet frame doesn't have to know anything about the downstream rate, and the GMSK mod doesn't really have to care anything about tags, it's just passing them along. Um, so, so th this will be very. Anyone doing finite bursts and is having some kind of trouble, maybe with, with the transfer, should just take a look at what we've done in that block. Okay, and uh, like I said, this is a hierarchical block, so you can see uh, some pad sinks and pad sources, and this is going to let us connect it to a higher level flow graph. Uh, once again, you'll see there's a uh, control in and out, uh, and those are currently unused, and, and therefore future uh, user implemented hooks, and then the others are actually. Uh, the data in and out, pack it in and pack it out. And we'll see that in the uh, top level block. Oh, a little note about the, the crazy colors. Um, um, I would like to. Who's got a laser pointer? There was one here. Laser pointer. You can't tell where I'm pointing? There was a nice green one Corgan had. Good man. Is that, that dot clear? Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> can dual wield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yeah, so just to follow the DMOD chain while we're in the mod. Here, here's, here's the usurp source. 
and it follows two paths. One, one, the data goes right in here to be interpreted by some blocks in the CDMA engine. And the other one, it's going straight. Here's the DMOD path, GMSK DMOD. This is a packet, essentially a correlator. And uh, out, out pops, essentially, messages. And they go out to the uh, outside application and uh, back into the TDMA engine. And we can see the uh, modulator chain as well. This will, this will essentially take in, see, we should have packets in. And they'll go in here, and some decision making is made. And uh, data is framed, comes out here, data is framed, goes into the modulator. Uh, this multiply const is just to bring the, uh, sig the signal level down, because I think this is a 1.0 amplitude. We could actually optimize this out, but anyway. Uh, and th this block is really important. This block is responsible for uh, correctly uh, moving the end of burst tag to the true last sample in the burst. This is going to prevent you from having, let's say, an underflow. You'll, you'll truly have a start and stop of burst on the very first and last sample. Um, so I guess, hmm? Go ahead. Yes. This will, uh, yeah, this, this rely, huh? Oh, okay, sorry about that. This does require the US, USRP timestamp feature. Uh, the TDMA, these USERPs are all uh, synchronized. Well, this is one USERP in here, but you presumably would have each application that runs this would have a USERP that is synchronized to a common time or concept of time. So that might be uh, maybe you've shared a reference or maybe each one has a GPSDO. That, that's just how we did the uh, TDMA implementation here. There, you could, you could find, you, there could be more than one way to do it. That's how this is implemented. I mean, you, you could probably gut this out and do something real simple, just, you know, send data that comes in and uh, spit anything that comes out. You know, you, you would avoid this whole little helpful feedback information. You could, or you could do a carrier sense in here, just like the tunnel FI is doing. Well, the, the lowest layer of carrier, carrier sense needs to go left. Needs to go, hmm? Pumps into the source. Has to, done, has to be done in the FPGA. Okay, yeah. That's where it needs to be. That's where it really needs to be. Very open feedback loop. We're making improvements on the tunnel of high one step. You send a message out that says, I have protected carrier, and therefore I have not allowed the transmitter to go out. But I mean, that's a major rework. Maybe. I mean, all right. Well, um, just a quick note on the weird colors. Um, the, the, whole, the whole message passing is implemented on top of essentially a, uh, a byte stream, and bytes are colored purple. It just so happens that we have this kind of, in GRC, if you don't specify the type, it just makes it white, and it sucks up whatever type you connect it to. So the, the purple and white are all basically, uh, they mean the same thing. So um, here's, here's a little screenshot. That we, there's a whole bunch of parameter blocks down here not shown, but we, we've, uh, we've now plugged in that hierarchical block I just showed above, uh, you see the control ports are kind of nulled out. We're not using them for anything. And, and essentially, here, here's your MAC layer. Um, it's a simple, you know, um, let's say RQ, uh, something request, accept and request, <clears throat> going on in here. And there's just some configuration parameters, so we can give this a particular address. So each, each, each usurp would run, run this with perhaps a different address on it. Um, and I guess what I really want to point out in here is we've got this little thing called tune tap. Now this is what tunnel.py has got. This is your interface into some virtual Ethernet interface where the host could now, you know, push data into it and read data out of it. And all that all that data you wrote into tune tap externally would come up here as a message, or come back here and go out as a message into this tune tap block. And and and, and the, this whole thing uh, we kind of did this just for you know posterity's sake since tunnel.py has tune tap in it. But this could be anything. Um, this could be a, 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 we have a UDP or a TCP socket to blob and vice versa that could plug right in here. And you could have uh, some external user application that's just writing to a, uh, let's say, TCP socket. Messages will come in. Messages will go out. Um, and, and I think there, there's, there's a few little uh, kind of channel or DMUX type blocks. That, and w what that does is you could have N... Um, sources of data potentially. Maybe you've got one UDP sync and there's a little user terminal on it. And maybe there's another one and it's running like a, 
uh, say VNC streaming a video stream. So you could have potentially n of these, and there's a we have a, we have a few blocks uh, which are essentially just supposed to take that data uh, and and key it correctly so that the ARQ can s- block here can see that it is one type of message or another and properly essentially put some framing bits on it. And that's all that this is really a responsible for doing is seeing what comes in and out and doing proper framing and uh, deframing. And you'd have the same thing on the output is there, there would be a block here. They would say, okay, you got me uh, a message with this particular key and he would figure out where to send it uh, to a particular UDP sync or TCP sync, or maybe not, maybe a tune tap. And uh, technically this block is extensible enough that you could have multiple uh, TDMA hierarchical blocks, multiple usurps plugged in that uh, you could do the same kind of mux and demux thing with the messages and the keys. So um, let's see if I've, I think we're about at the end of this, so we'll see if we got any questions on this. Um, yeah, here's the description for the, uh, the Mac layer block we have in there. This is all written in Python, so we'll, I'll go point out the code. You can kind of take a look at it. Um, it's really just a, a responsible for packing and unpacking some like meta information on top of the um, message that the user shoves in. And you're also doing the repeat <coughs> if data is lost. So, if you want to write, if you're curious and want to write this down, there's the GRX, there's wiki page, the GitHub URL. Everything, everything that I mentioned is on this branch called pre underscore cog. You can check it out. All the examples that I've got screenshots of are in the examples directory. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can uh, get this running up at the Hackfest or something tomorrow. Uh, here's the contact information. That's me. That's John. And uh, last slide. We'll do, any, any, any time for anyone to write that down? I might post something to the list in case anyone's curious. <coughs> All right, we're getting a few pictures taken. I will send a message to the list. You can get this all digitally. OCR. You know. All right. So uh, I, I guess uh, I'm present. J- John has been not kind enough to kind of push this work before it's uh, cleaned up. So uh, he's very brave. Uh, I, get, I guess uh, the future is basically just to improve this, improve these examples, make them better, work out some bugs. Um, I did have a plan to put together a little wiki page on it. I did not get around to doing that. So um, I'll probably get around to that later today. But if you if you follow the directions on the slide below here above here, you can uh, you can get the code. So uh, time for questions, and I'll skip back and forth between a few slides if you need me to point to anything specific. So questions or comments in the back. Okay, so the question was a little bit how the receive tags work and, and maybe some other. I'll, I'll tell you what the user, exactly what the user source does and let me know if that, that's not doing it for you. So um, uh, essentially in the, in the user source, we tag um, whenever, we, just, we send a tag whenever the user does any, uh, I think, sample rate and frequency changes. And that's kind of a convenience thing. Now what it does as far as the time is the very first time it starts up and a sample comes in, that very first sample is tagged. Now you, you get a, you get a time, and then any samples you get after that, you can interpolate what that what the time is, just because there's some sample count, and it's and it's fixed, and there's no, so um, basically given a sample offset, and the last time you saw a time tag, you can figure out the exact time of any sample you're looking at. Now the issue comes when you get something, let's say, an overflow, and something's lost. Now that time interpolation is no longer good. So what the uh, source block does is it sends a new time tag after an overflow to give the downstream a concept of time again. So what you really want to do in your downstream block is just look for tags every time work is called and take the la- and all- and just save the last timestamp tag you see and what offset it was at. And you'll always be able to use that and figure out what the time is. Yes. Uh, all of the features you can do with a GR block, you should be able to do in Python. 
which includes pushing uh, and reading stream tags and writing them. And I think uh, some of these blocks will stand as a good example of doing that. In the back? I may have done that. Is a C++ called like tags demo or something? I don't think you have to do that. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I did that because it made the code convenient to write in some way, and it's that's not necessary. I'll have to take a look at that again. But what you're, you start out idle, so you shouldn't have to essentially send anything until you want to. Uh, essentially, uh, TX is kind of a uh, passive state like that. You don't; It doesn't have to be configured. Once it sees data, it goes into stream mode. And it'll stay that way until it either doesn't see samples or you tell end of burst. Now, if it doesn't see samples and you haven't told end of burst, there'll be an underflow. And there's some time window in which it, it kind of stays in TX state, hoping to get more samples before it just... It, it times out and leaves that underflow state. So if you don't do anything initially, ev everything is fine. If you produce any samples at all, it will go into transmit. It'll it'll go into transmit. Well, if those have a time on it and that time hasn't yet expired, those samples will go all the way out in the user and just sit there. But I mean, it, no. So the 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 essentially all the RF switches and stuff go into transmit state when the timestamp on your packet is reached, and then then it all goes. So you just have to be conscious of like what you're feeding it and when you're feeding it. But it's only really ever going to be in the TX state when the samples are going through the uh, digital op converter chain in the DSP. Okay. So Go ahead. How much is the size of the FPG buffer on the traffic side? Uh, there, there's a... It can be fairly large. On the N210... There's a one megabyte SRAM, and that's something like 10 milliseconds at 25 mega samples a second. So you, you kind of do the math if you're doing one mega sample a second. That can be rather large. So one of the things you have to do is you, you can't just uh, transmit some indefinite amount of data because it will all back up. And then as soon as you want to send good data, you're going to have to wait for that to all be passed through the buffer. Okay. That's correct. Only the timestamp for the first sample is, is actually sent because you can. We didn't want to overload any downstream blocks with you know a, a, a tag for every single packet because it's very easy to interpolate that information. Okay. Okay. The next timestamp. You might have to clarify. Uh, the are coming in, in the USRP sync. That's correct. USRP source. USRP source. They're coming in to the USRP source. And uh, so, I mean, every packet contains Yes. And, and, and those should be interpolated such that, you know, if you, took the, if you knew the sample rate and the number of samples, the next timestamp should be exactly interpolatable. Okay. Um, 
don't have any more slides. Uh, well, okay, how about this? Do you have a specific question? And then maybe I can elaborate on it. It'll may help to make sense. The, the message, so the message passing is implemented entirely on top of stream tag. I'll, I'll talk over a picture. Maybe that'll help. It's a little irrelevant, but um, <clears throat> inside of uh, and this this doesn't do justice because you can have a block with message ports. In it. Okay, so so a block, one of these blocks, let's say that that socket the blob, is actually it's a hierarchical block, and and you you can tell it how many ports you want for the, the real stream ports, and you tell it how many message passes ports you want. And what it does under the hood is it creates you know, your real block with your source and sync stream ports, and it'll create hierarchical blo another block for the, the message stuff in and out. And, uh, and what that does internally is it just, those, those message to block, they're just little threads that are getting called by the scheduler, and the API basically takes those and passes them off into queues. So when your work function gets called for that real block with those streams in there, you have access to essentially reading messages that were you know, produced by these little message guys running in the hierarchical block, but you're, you know, there's no work function getting called for that. And you, when you push messages out, they're actually just getting sent into a queue to the other hierarchical blocks doing the message outputs, and they're just writing a downstream tag and sending out some samples. So it's essentially, essentially, yes, yeah, streams are going in between these little mini message blocks hidden in the, hier in, hidden in the hierarchy. They're dumping the samples and taking the stream tags out and stuffing them into a queue. So, and all the messages are still... Uh, GR tag T objects. Um, right, so this will allow you to do have a block that's purely always taking input going this way to send can send an outstream to uh, send messages the other way. It's like completely asynchronous because they're actually decoupled internally. Okay. So, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, the message ports are asynchronous to the stream ports. Would be one way to one way to say that. We've always had that. I mean, that's, that's been the way message passing has always been, right? I mean, we've never guaranteed that a message is going to necessarily show up at any given time. Right, right, right. The stream tags are completely coupled with the stream. Okay. Cool. Oh uh, yeah, this is the hierarchical block, and this is it getting implemented into a top-level flow graph. Uh, yeah, so the, the tune tap thing is uh, it opens a little like dev whatever gr zero using that all the same stuff in tunnel up high basically, and uh, uh, the data coming in and out of it. Like normally you'd you do a you would do a read to get the data out, and you'd do a, a write to put data into it. And so we've integrated that with the, the message ports. So the message coming into it now gets called send on that file descriptor and you know the read we got a little thing that's reading and looping over it and whenever it reads something passes it out as a message on the other end how do you put it down how do you connect it um open up the it, it, this is one of the complaints about grc earlier but if, if you open up the tdma hierarchical flow graph and click generate It'll put a. Um, it'll essentially install itself in your home directory and then reopen GRC and it should be there. I know. We we gotta we gotta add something in GRC that I think reloads stuff whenever a hierarchical block is kind of mentioned. Does it work? It's on the to do list. Um, the, so um, during the tunnel.py example, um, I noticed that, so we were sending out a packet, the guy was receiving it, and then transmitting reply, and that reply didn't seem to be going out, um, and I think it's because the original sender was not having its burst ending, and therefore it was sitting in underrun state just a little bit longer than it than it would have had you ended the burst. It was sitting in transmit mode because it was underrunning, and therefore it didn't see the response from 
party B. Um, so we've what what I did there is that, or John did, is that precog burst gate, and that is. So I, the I think we've modified the packet framer to essentially push out start and stop of burst tags, and then we have that precog thing to correct the uh, end of burst tag due to the interpolation. And therefore, as soon as that everything goes out, it should immediately switch into RX mode. So, so it's possible that was the issue we were seeing tunnel pi. It's, it's a, I think it's a good guess. Uh, we'd have to prove it. The only, the only reason there is because the um, interpolation is that w when you do an interpolation, the uh, stream tag kind of rounds down where the index will be, and you just end up with the end of burst in the wrong place. And if that happens, you're essentially sending more samples after you've ended the burst, and that's going to turn into an underflow. How do, how do we implement the uh, burst gate, basically? Um, so it's actually so. It, I think imagine you're sending a lot of data into the in, into the precog burst gate. You actually don't want to end burst because you have more data ahead. Um, you maybe there's a timestamp and it makes some decision on that. I, I can't. I, don't, I haven't looked into it too much, so I can't give you all the details. But basically, if you're doing small finite sends, the last thing you'll see in your work function, the last sample, like if you see an end of burst and you see a few more samples, you, you, I think it's safe to assume that that last thing is actually the last sample, and then you can move the end of burst there. If you see um, another start of burst, though, you know that there's more stuff ahead of it, and then you actually probably don't want to end burst. But that, that's actually a little decision-making thing you might want to do based on the timestamps delivered in the pack. You say, oh, I see a timestamp and a start of burst. Well, okay, I do really want to do this end of burst. But maybe you see no timestamp. There's no reason to end the burst. So there's a little decision-making process. But basically, it, it, I think we're, we're making an assumption based on that if the scheduler has given you the sample that contains the end of burst, that you will have all of the remaining samples left over from that kind of interpolation stretch. Based on that assumption, that's safe to do, if that assumption is correct. And I believe it is. So the problem is that with the interpolating setting, is that just a systematic error in, in our rounding? Or is it no, there's nothing you can do about it. Because if you interpolate the, the start of burst, like you've got, you interpolate by two. Now you have an ambiguity of two. Where do you put the start tag? Where do you put the end tag? You want the start tag at the beginning, and you want the end tag at the end. And there's no really way to kind of communicate where something should go when it gets interpolated. Okay. And there's a different rule for start and stop. Yeah, and that's just integer rounding, right? It's just going to end up at the zero position. That might be some further discussion of how you a more formal way to do that. But this is one way to do it, and I believe it's it's safe because it's inherent to how the scheduler works, and you will get those samples at the end, or more tags. So. Pretty much anything that would have start, if you want to give a generic name to burst, just about it. We need the gr tag constants dot h. Standardize on. Okay. Yes, because we had a scope up and running on the antenna switch to watch it live, and I actually was sent some screenshots of that, but I don't have it in the. Display. So this actually ran, and I sat next to John while he ran it, but I didn't personally do it. So it was very cool. Yeah, should be pretty arbitrary. I mean, down to the the clock rate. Yeah, because it, it, this is this is truly using the time tags to schedule things. So it's very precise so when they go out. All right. The the FP so the whole DSP chain should be completely idle, which means the cortic is actually sitting in a reset state 
There, there's no data. All, all of the whole, the whole thing is kind of FIFO based. So it's just it's literally not doing anything. And and so there's a little bit that says TX run and TX run is zero. And what happens is all the this kind of the switches on the board that would react or change to TX or RX state are set to either RX state or idle. Depends if you're receiving or not. And then that switch should happen as soon as the last sample leaves. It should it should do that switch. All right. I think we need. Well, okay. So there's some discussion about stream tags and having a a constants file to kind of declare all the types of stream tags or the most common type of stream tags we would want to use in GNU Radio. And we always put those off because we said, okay, we need to see uh, stream tags in action. We need a use case, uh, you know, before we just go ahead and do this. And I, I think we have enough of a use case to start that, and you know, it could start a trend. And, and um, I think a few things we've learned is that we, we do want start and stop tags of some sort, obviously to maybe dictate packet boundaries or dictate burst boundaries, and that might be different things. So maybe we have a start and stop frame and start and stop a burst. Um, one thing that's very important is that RX and TX tags need to be different, and I think we've realized that is that. Uh, an RX start of burst is not a TX start of burst. I mean, just imagine if you had a usurp source connected to a usurp sync. All the tags coming out of the source would then go go right back into the sync and apply. And we, we kind of – maybe you shouldn't be connecting a usurp source right to a usurp sync. But the idea that a, a tag going down, going out of a flow graph is should be conceptually different than a tag going into a flow graph. So I would I would kind of expect to do the same thing if we had a uh, framer or correlator tags where it would be kind of a – Start and stop in, start and stop out. Um, so that's that's all I've learned about tags. So yeah, we could put together a header file. There's a few common things: start and stop, time. Uh, I don't know how else they've been used. Probably if you could like sample rate, frequency, common parameters you tend to see in blocks. It wouldn't be hard to put it together and kind of organically grow it. At the Hackfest. All right. Any more questions? It's the same people. Go ahead. Ooh. I, I, I forgot I forgot a little mentionable in here. Let's see. See this uh PMT RPC block? I should have mentioned that. This is just sitting in the flow graph. And what this does is it takes a message in and executes an arbitrary function in the flow graph in Python. This is actually how we can uh, dynamically control a few things, just given kind of an arbitrary message in here. So you could have a, a block, some kind of engine like this, push out messages like tune and with a time, some kind of message containing a timestamp and maybe a tune instruction. And this would just execute something right on your Python flow graph, like a user of source. You'd have a little function that would say, you know, set the command time, issue this tune, and the command time. And, and you, you could do that with this framework, having a, uh, some kind of an engine block producing control messages. That's what I was kind of talking about, control plane. So this, you, this sh we should be able to do a frequency hopping block j just that looks pretty much like this, just different stuff in the guts here. Maybe a little different functions kind of written into the flow graph as well. Yes, there's still settling time of hardware. Yeah, you, you have to deal with the... That's why we schedule things. And then there's still some... Yeah, and you'd have to concept. So if you know you tuned to time X, and the worst case tuning time for the front end is 300 microsec or microseconds SBX, you would, ha you would be have to be aware of that time delta before you transmit it. Ah, I see. So that's kind of like 
the source block should actually have a message port to control it, rather than this kind of hack around, this guy calling a function on here. You might actually want to push messages or put them along with the stream, and that's value. So the, the idea with pushing it along with the stream is to have it conceptually tied to the samples in time. But really, if you have the ability to transmit the samples at a certain time, and if you have the ability to send the commands at a certain time, you really don't need to associate it with the stream itself. Because that, that whole thing can be done asynchronous, asynchronously, and then the usurp actually performs synchronization for you. So two different paths, same execution time. But there, there's still merit, I think, in this actually taking messages and, and responding to that rather than this um, kind of RPC block sitting in the flow graph. Cool?